Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of What We Can't Not Talk About, the podcast of the Austin Institute for the Study of Family and Culture. After an episode on evolutionism, where we pondered whether our ancestors are monkeys, we're now going to talk about our descendants, or maybe about the lack of descendants. Um, in this episode, we will be focusing on a phenomenon that most of my peers and colleagues, and I, I would say most people on the street, um, seem to be unaware of or very confused about. We will talk today about the absolute and global decline of fertility and what that might mean for us all. And I said that most people seem to be unaware of it because even though um, many are familiar today with the West um, declining fertility uh, in the US, in my own country, Italy, and or in Japan, most people I'd say my age and younger um, do not seem to think that it would be a good idea to marry, to get married young and to have kids. We keep investing on gym memberships, uh, keep investing in cars, but very few seem to care enough about the future of their nations, their family and their last name. And furthermore, I'm sure that many of you, even among the listeners, um, are still convinced that there's, there were those worries from the 80s about the overpopulation uh, are still somehow, they still have some reasons to exist. I know people say, yeah, the West population is declining, but there's so many people in China, so many people in India that there is going to be, you know, lack of food, lack of land and lack of housing. Well, what I would like, you know, for us all to understand today is that, yeah, this, some of these problems and some of them, these fears might be well-grounded, but for reasons that are different from immigration. And so to tell us more about what happened to the population bomb, uh, to illustrate what fertility truly looks like today, and to speculate uh, a little bit about what this might mean in the near future, we are very lucky to have with us today one of the world's greatest experts on global fertility numbers, the economist and professor Jesus Fernandez Villaverde. Good afternoon, Jesus, and welcome on our show. Thank you for having me here. Good afternoon to you too. Uh, Dr. Fernandez Villaverde is currently professor of economics at the University of Pennsylvania, where he serves as director of graduate studies in the economics department. And um, just to clarify, Jesus, if you let me, why we're very lucky to have you uh, on our show, I would like to add that you're a visiting professor at University of Oxford, visiting fellow at Nuffield College, Oxford, visiting scholar at the Federal Reserve Banks of Chicago, New York, Philadelphia, the Bank of Spain, advisor to the Hoover Institution, Stanford University Regulation and Rule of Law Initiative, and a member of the National Bureau of um, Economic Research and the Center for uh, Economic Policy Research. And I'm going to stop here, even though this is not all, there is more in your resume. So <laughs> in brief, as usual, we are very, very lucky at the Austin Institute to have these amazing guests that, uh, so first of all, Thank you, Jesus, for sharing some of your very precious time with us. Of course, always happy to talk about these issues. Yeah. So before we get into the issue mm -hmm. itself, any idea uh, how you accomplished all of that? And I mean, you're not 70 years old. I can testify. And people can, <laughs> you know, the ones watching can see it. You're pretty young. And uh, so do you, do you know how you made it? Oh, uh, I don't know. Well, I, I put a lot of hours and that I can tell you. So I think it was Edison who said that 99% of success is greed. And I always explain to my undergrads that I disagree because I think that he underappreciates the importance of greed. 99% is not even close. It's, I think, 99.9%. .9%. So working hard uh, pays off. I always try to tell that to my graduate students. Some of them do not seem to believe it, but yes, working hard pays off in the long run. In the long run, yeah, absolutely. Um, so how, why, what led you to, to decide to study um, economy, if I may? Mm, well, so I'm, I'm from Spain. And when I was growing up, um, the economic situation in Spain was not that great. Well, <laughs> it's still not that great today, but well, that's a different story. 
And so I guess that, you know, you are 15, 16 years old and, you know, you read the newspaper, inflation is high, unemployment is high, there is exchange rate problems. So, you know, I guess that people who are a little bit interested in what is going on start paying attention. I was one of them. And I soon realized that economics was a good way to think about the world. It's not the only way. It's not a perfect way. In that sense, I always highlight that economics is just a tool, not an end in itself. And I went to college. I started studying economics and, you know, happens to be the case that I'm more or less half decent at it. So I started getting good grades in exams and then people say, well, why don't you do a PhD? And I thought, well, that kind of sounds fun. So I did a PhD in economics. And then people say, why don't you become a professor? And I say, well, that kind of sounds fun. And here I am. Which is not exactly what every economic student, every PhD is told is the next step. So it also speaks of like some of the <laughs> innate qualities you had probably now yeah, you know. went <laughs> into the topics. But um, so what, what from there, from the study of economics, why starting studying fertility? Well, so one of the things I was always very, very interested in was populations. So who is around us? You know, how do we came here? Where, where is our future? And I remember I, I gave a talk at Austin, actually, Texas Austin, a few weeks ago. And there was an anecdote that I was going to tell, and then I didn't have the chance. So maybe in the podcast, I can add it. So I love numbers. I love numbers since I was a very small kid. You know, I'm the type of kid that, you know, when you are six years old, he will know how much steel was produced in France and how much coal was produced in Germany. And my parents bought me this book of statistics and I will spend hours and hours and hours reading it. And uh, one of the pages of the book, I, I recall it perfectly, was about the island of Mauritius in the Indian Ocean. And one of the things that... Um, that page was describing was how population was exploding in Mauritius and how, you know, that was going to be a total disaster for the country. They were going to get overpopulated. This is an island. There is no much more space for anyone else in the island. And what are we going to do? So that really impressed me a lot. And I thought, gee, one really needs to understand a little bit demographics and uh, fertility. So when I got to college, I took some courses that had a lot of demographic and fertility uh, aspects to it. And then in my PhD thesis, uh, one of the chapters, I have like three or four chapters in my thesis, one of the chapters was precisely on fertility. And I have kept working on it since then, um, you know, coming back and forth and depending on the time. And in particular, and perhaps the most relevant thing for, for this conversation was that around 2017, 2018, I started to notice a very interesting pattern in the data. And it's not that fertility is falling. So if you actually talk with demographers and people mm -hmm. who have been looking at fertility, everyone was aware that fertility was falling um, for the last 30, 50 years. So that, that was not new. What I noticed is how fast it was falling. Okay, so it's just not that it's falling, it's, it's that the slope at which it's falling was much steeper than anyone had anticipated. So just to give you an anecdote again, or a very simple example, I remember reading a book in 2017 saying, look, fertility is falling so fast that in Thailand, a country that you know most of us will not associate with having low fertility, they are going to have negative population growth by 2030. And I was like, wow, Thailand in 2030. You actually know which year Thailand first had negative population growth? 2020. Wow. So it was 10 years, 10 years earlier that even the most alarmist, if you may want to say that, or the most aggressive forecast of where fertility was going to push Thailand into negative population growth. So I decided that I had uh, to... If I yeah, may, when you say negative part. population growth, that means how many kids per woman? Uh, so in the case of Thailand, you know, and I'm quoting from the top of my head, so please, you know, uh, listeners, yeah, yeah, yeah. if I if I get errors... No, no, I'm not, and I'm not, yeah. no, I'm not, I'm not... No, no, I know, I know, but Thailand, it's but... around 1.1 kids per woman. Okay, but the replacement would be... 1.1. Wow. Yeah, this is this is very easy. Think about it in this way. So a woman has 
um, on average, in, a, in nature, we tend to have a little bit more boys than women. So if, if you don't do anything crazy, like uh, uh, selective abortions, there are around 105 boys born for each 100 uh, girls. So you need, if you're a woman, you need to have a little bit more than two kids to have at least one girl so that she can reproduce herself, okay? And in addition to it, some of the girls you are going to have are not going to complete her reproduction life because, you know, accidents happen even in advanced countries, people die early, etc. And that's why we say it's roughly 2.1. And it's very simple. It's like, if you have 2.1 kids on average, one will be a girl, a little bit more than one will be a, a, a boy, and you have a little bit of extra slack for the ones, for the girls who do not make it to... So this you know, would keep the population static, constant, right? Constant. In the long run. Yeah, in the long run. Uh, so, yeah. Yes. Yeah, so if you're having 1.1, 1. 1, it means you're having around 0.55 girls per woman. So you see that that's basically cutting the population in half in a couple of generations. But so you said that what you're noticing compared to others is not just the decline is that it's faster. But so what happened? Because I meet a lot of people in their 50s or 60s or so, and I still hear about the population bomb fears. So yeah. could we first address that part and say, you know, like, what was it that they said in the 70s and what actually happened? Okay. So, well, first of all, I think that people in the 60s were in general a little bit crazy, not a great decade for humanity. So, but mm -hmm. you know, let's forget about that for a second. What happens in the 1950s and 1960s is that mortality falls very fast. Okay. And the reason why mortality falls very fast in a lot of uh, developing economies is because the very basic things you need to do to increase life expectancy from 40 to 65 are actually surprisingly simple. So you have antibiotics. Okay, so we invent antibiotics. By the 19 by 1955, pretty much everyone in an advanced in a in a developing economy can get antibiotics. We learn that you need to wash your hands before eating. Uh, we learn that you need to have access to good sanitation. And of course, if you are in Kenya or you are in Tanzania, this is not Austin. You still don't have access to the best medical services. But just doing very, very little gets you a very long way in terms of increasing life expectancy. So you are having all these countries with a still very high fertility, but mortality goes down a lot. And that generates a lot of population growth. But the population growth was not because people were having more children on average, it's because less of them were dying and people were living longer. What happens starting in the mid 1960s that fertility starts dropping? And that's why even already in the late, in the late 1960s, I think the most insightful demographers argue that this idea that there was a time bomb was actually not very accurate. Okay, that fertility was going to fall and that was going to put population back into a little bit more of a sustainable long-run growth. What has surprised most people, as I was mentioning before, is how fast this drop has been, especially over the last 10, 15 years. Which was not part of those predictions. But um, if, exactly. is it a legitimate question to ask an economist why? Yeah, so of course, I mean, that's what I, you know, why why my dean is under the impression that he's paid me a wage <laughs> to try to understand why. Um, so um, a lot of people there, I will say there are like three main theories out there, and then I can tell you which ones I believe more, I believe mm -hmm. less. Um, so one very popular theory among economists is that um, in the modern world, um, you really want to educate your children. So you are in a in a farm, think about in a farm, in a, a developing economy in 1960, you have a lot of children. By the time you are 12, they are 12, you put them to work in the, in the fields. And now, <laughs> excuse me, you want your kids to complete high school, maybe even to go to college, uh, maybe go to graduate school. That suddenly makes the proposition of having a, a kid way more expensive, not only in terms of money, but also in terms of time. So think about, um, if I may use a slightly stereotypical uh, example, your soccer mom in the American suburb. You basically pick up your kids from school at three o'clock and until eight o'clock, you are like 
five hours with them every day, well, you don't really have time for a lot of other things, which means that having more than two or three kids suddenly becomes really very, very expensive. Mm -hmm. Uh, so that's theory one. Uh, it has the name of quality quantity trade-off, which is one of those things that economists say and sounds very scary, but it basically says somehow we want to have kids with a lot of investment on them. Mm -hmm. uh, the second the second theory um, uh, highlights more that, uh, you know, maybe at this moment um, there has been a change in cultural, in culture norms, uh, in gender norms, uh, some of it may be positive. So for instance, it's usually the case that when you ask in the in poor countries to men how many children you want to have, and you ask the wives how many children you want to have, you get very different answers. And you can see why. Uh, you can see that, you know, uh, especially in, in developing economies, the men do not really spend a lot of time with the kids. So having one more kid is, you know, like having another beer, not a big problem. It's the woman who is around and needs to take care of the kids. So as we have moved more and more towards uh, some gender equality in a lot of these countries, we have moved in that direction. Women are reasserting themselves a little bit more and they want to have less kids. Which I would, just before you go to the third, I would yeah. interrupt and invite this, the listener to listen to uh, the episode we have with Clara Piano that talked about the fertility, another economist colleague of yours that talked about the fertility gap. So why actually in the West, women have less kids than they say they want. So mm -hmm. that yeah. would, in my way, disprove the credibility of second mm -hmm. if if left to women. But let's go to the third. Yeah, and the third one is highlights that modern society is organized in a way that this just makes it very difficult to have kids. Uh, so let me give you an example. Um, when I was a small kid, <laughs> my dad will give me the equivalent of maybe $10 in the morning during the summer at nine o'clock in the morning, kick me out of the house and say, you know, you kind of figure it out your life on your own. Don't come back home before 8 p.m., which basically means that during the summer months, I was not really at home bothering them. And, you know, you go around and I actually thought that um, those experiences of figuring it out on your own were very valuable in my life. Uh, this has become absolutely unacceptable in modern society. If you tell anyone that I'm going to give my kids twenty dollars, kick him out of the house, and you know just tell him to go around yeah. and explore life on his own for six or seven hours, chances are that social services workers will knock on my door within the next uh, five hours. Yeah. And this is just an example, but more in general, I think that uh, for a number of reasons, we have organized modern societies in ways that are very difficult for families to have uh, kids and people respond in rational ways. I mean, it's not, look, when economists say that people are rational, we don't mean, okay, I sit at home with my wife and we get Excel and we write down the costs and the benefits of having a kid. Because otherwise, I mean, if, if rationality requires Excel, yeah. I'm completely rational. <laughs> yeah, no, no. But the, the way, the way I explain this is as follows. Look, you're a couple, you have already two kids and, you know, you, you go out for a walk and, and one of the spouses says, you know, should we have another kid? And the second spouse says, oh, it's so difficult. And, you know, life is so complicated. That's what we mean by rationality. It's not that, you know, they do like an Excel file and they get like the, yeah. the double digit right. But, you know, one of the spouses is saying, look, this is so difficult. My life is so complicated. We cannot really have another kid. And the other spouse says, yeah, you are right. Okay. Yeah. And then the cool car is a two seat car. And yeah, the plane yeah. is not welcoming kids yes. on board. Yeah. and It's making you pay a full yeah. price by the time they yeah. are. I don't know how old. Uh, probably. Yeah. So let me. Yeah. Let me give you an example of a policy that. <laughs> probably most people have not thought that it's actually bad for fertility, which is the fact that now it's compulsory to have these kids' seats in the safety seats in the car. Well, it basically means that it's impossible to have more than two kids that require the seat in any given moment. Okay. And then as a society, look, I understand the reason why we are doing that. We want to increase safety, but we are also making the life of everyone with kids very difficult. Um, when we were small kids, we were five brothers. You know, my dad will squeeze the four of us in the back seat, and that was it. And, you know, like everything is about choices. Society is always about choices. And, you know, maybe we have gone a little bit too crazy on the side of safety. And by being so obsessed with safety, uh, we have really making life with kids so difficult. And, yeah, I think on that on that front, I would recommend for anyone who hasn't read it yet, it might be a, the, the con, another reading group in the future, we might have it on that the famous book by now, The Coupling of the American Mind, where 
a large part of it is about uh, the security and the lack of childhood and adulting that children go through because of these needs, which, as you say, some, I mean, it's true that New York is scary for a child to visit on his own, but maybe the right thing is not to keep him home, but to develop cities in a different way. So I get that from your description of the three theories, you tend to gravitate towards the third one or? Mm, I think that all three have a little bit to them. And I think it depends also in which country are you talking about. So if you are asking me why is fertility dropping so fast in Brazil, I would say probably the first theory, the fact that people want to invest more on their kids have a lot to say to it. Mm -hmm. But then if you are going to tell me why Utah has so many more kids than Vermont, uh, no, well, I think that theory two and theory three have a lot to say. So ah. it's probably it's probably easier to have kids in Utah than to have kids in Vermont. Since we're we're having a conference in in Rome in uh, a month about the status of the family and fertility in my home country, yeah. So you know, if you were to to say what is the reason in a country like that for having been for a long time now, yeah, one of the country with the lowest fertility. Uh, and I don't know how rapid is the decline, but I know that this past year was the lowest since yeah. the unification of the country. Mm -hmm. Well, I guess that in particular in the case of Southern European countries, Spain, Italy, Greece, Portugal, is basically because we have made decisions about our labor markets and, and a way how uh, work, how jobs are allocated that make it extremely difficult for people to get married early in life and get the job security. Um, you know, I look around in Southern Europe and I see people who are 28, 29. They have never really have a very good job. They are interns. They are making peanuts. Uh, houses, condos, and, and flats are so expensive. Um, seriously, how are you going to have a kid? I mean, I, I will just think about myself if I had to stay in Spain. How in the world with the wage that a 32-year-old kid makes today in Madrid, are you going to afford getting yourself a flat, getting yourself married and having two kids? It's, it's just doesn't, it just doesn't work. It's not. So um, I think that especially in the Northern, in a lot of Northern European countries, especially in Scandinavia, they have made much more of an effort to move towards those type of policies I was mentioning of making life a little bit easier for families. And again, I'm not claiming that by having much more favorable policies towards families, we are going to go from 1.1 kid per woman to eight, like, you know, mm -hmm. it was in Sicily in 1800. But if you can go from 1.1 to 1.9, it's a very different society. It's a society that, you know, population is just going down a little bit. You know, we can more or less handle that, but it's not a population where <laughs> it's going down a cliff. So I'm not I'm not suggesting that we have a magic wand that will increase fertility back to three, and that's probably not even a good idea anyway. But I think we have a lot of levers from the position of a government to go back to 1.1 to 1.8, 1.7, and that will be a completely different ball game along many, many different dimensions. Yeah, and... Okay, so you mentioned that what you noticed, and you know, you're famous among scholars for that, is that you you point out a faster decline in fertility, not just a decline, but a faster one. Do the numbers that you find, you know, are they published elsewhere? Like, do the international organization defend your same ideas? Are you alone as a scholar in thinking that there is this I, rapid decline? No, no. I mean, I, 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 I. So you suggested I can share a screen. Can I do that? Oh, yeah, you can. For the ones at okay. least that are watching, absolutely. Okay, yeah, but I think you need oh, to give... Oh, yeah, I need to do one of those things. Sure, <laughs> making so you First host. of all, I, I want to take out, you know, any suspicion from, from the listeners that I'm using at some secret data from some secret service. No, no, I'm just going to show you in uh, Wikipedia. Okay, so this cannot be any more, um, any more public that, that Wikipedia. Okay, so if you go to, and, and again, I think that my only merit is that I love numbers and I just look at tables. And, mm. and my only merit is that I look at tables more time than other people because I'm very, I'm, I'm a very boring person. 
So this is the Wikipedia page for the not true. Not true. I met him over dinner. It's not true. It's everything <laughs> but boring. But okay, keep going. Okay. So go to Wikipedia and put demographics of South Korea. Okay. Mm. So this is as easy as do as just doing a search on Wikipedia. And then look at register births and deaths. And mm. South Korea has 99.99% of registration. There is no people. Everyone who gets who dies or is born in South Korea gets registered over there. So look, in 1925, there were 13 million South Koreans and there were 558,000 births, okay? Which is around 43 births per 1,000 and 6.59 births per woman. Wow. Okay? Now, the peak in South Korea births was in 1960 when they were having 1,000,000.08 Fertility rate, the birth rate was still 43 per thousand and number of kids per woman were 6.16. So this is the people in the 1960s saying, wow, look, you know, South Koreans, they are having like 1.1 million yeah. kids, six point something kids per woman. That's why South Korea population, despite World War II and the Korean War, has gone from 13 million to 26 million in just one generation. Okay. But then something funny starts happening. Whoa, okay, I'm looking at the number. For the ones that are not watching, I'd recommend yes. switching yes. to YouTube. Yeah. Okay, so one, one million in 1971, 952, 922, 874, 796. And, you know, there are some years where it changes a little bit. Um, in Asian countries, you have this lunar calendar and there are years that are a little bit better to have kids. So you see a little bit of that effect. But but look, we move we move forward. By 2000, they are having 640,000 kids. And this has not stopped. Wow. By 2015, they are having 438,000 kids. In 2022, they have 249,000 kids. So how look at how, how fast this is. Between 200, sorry, 2010 to 2022, in just 2012 to 2022, in just 10 years, the number of children, number of births have yeah. fallen by 50%. Yeah, we have a 0 0.78. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So that means that the average Korean, South Korean woman is having 0 0.78 children, which means around 0 0.4 women. So if you have 100 women, the, the way to think about this is the following. Imagine that you have a club with 100 women. On average, they are going to have 40 women coming after them. Okay? But now, we already, South Korea, being a very advanced, high-technology country, we actually have data month by month. You see what happens in January 2023? another 6% reduction. So if you thought that 2022 was already incredibly Bad. low, yeah, okay, there was another 1,500 births less in South Korea. And again, I'm not using, you know, I, I want to get all the readers clear about this. This is not that I was able to, you know, break into the Pentagon, to the yeah, yeah. defense secret server, you know, server. Although we know you do, right? Yes, sure. Oh, all the time, yeah, all the time. Yeah. <laughs> this is just looking at the Wikipedia webpage for South Korea. Yeah. Okay. And if you go... There is also in some place, they also have fertility by cities. Mm -hmm. And I think that in Seoul, they are in like 0. 0.5. Which, yeah. Okay. So what you say is also, this is not true in South Korea is not just one. This is true yes. everywhere. Like, so okay. the overpopulation me... of China, of India, how about those? Let's, let's, let's go and see China. I also have it over here. Oh, wow. It was already there. Okay. Yeah. And again, this is Wikipedia, demographics of China. So you, you just go to Wikipedia, you put demographics of China. That's the first hit. Okay. So let's look at this. So China is having like 20 million, 20 million births, 20 million births. Of course, they have the great leap forward, you know, the worst case of human-made disaster ever. 
as I always say, in the history of humanity, the uh, the the biggest killer ever was not Hitler, was not Stalin, was Mao Zedong. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so then they have 29 million because it's like compensation for those years. But, you know, they are kind of around 27 million. Mm -hmm. Okay, so then things start to go down, to go down, to go down. And look, 20, 19, 18, 17, 16, 15. And keep going down, keep going down. In 2022, 9.5 million. Okay, we don't have terribly good data for births in China before 1920, but doing back of the envelope calculations, I think there are less births in China now than in the year 1750. And now I know that one of your listeners is thinking, oh, Jesus, this is the one child policy. Okay, let me show you it's not. Because I'm going to put demographics of Taiwan where Taiwan, no one-child policy. And let's look at how it's happening with kids in Taiwan. Let me see uh, vital statistics. So Taiwan, 1906, population 3 million people, live births, 119,000. And let's fast forward all the way down. 2022, 23 million. So the population has multiplied nearly by eight, 138,000. And again, fertility, 0. 0.87. Yeah. And you can see again my point about drops. Not that long ago, 10 years ago, fertility in Taiwan was 213,000. And now we are in 138. Yeah. And again, let's look at the first three months of 2023. Again, another 5.5% reduction. There were only 33,000 Taiwanese born in the first quarter of 2023. Which means that Taiwan will probably end up in 2022 below 130,000. And it's very easy to conquer nations where there's no one left yeah. to defend them, right? No, exactly. I mean, the problem is how is Taiwan going to have an army? Literally, they are not going to be boys. I mean, I, I could, my, my boy scout troop from high school could go and conquer Taiwan in 50 years. Which is also why, you know, a lot, you, you did mention during your talk, you know, that the fears about China invading the world and like taking, it's like, they're not, they're misplaced yeah. before the same reasons, right? Exactly. Yeah. So. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. And, and probably, yeah, we could stop maybe sharing unless you have other magic. No, 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 yes, uh, yes. Okay. Yeah. Um. Okay, so we describe this, I think, terrible scenario, which makes me think of, you know, how appropriate the term, the culture of death is for our times. It's shocking to think, you know, some people blame it on food, hormones, whatever it is that we are doing. There is a culture. There mm -hmm. is a lot. But you as an economist, um, you know, it struck me how clear you were uh, in the Three seat, uh, the, the three articles you published in Public Discourse, where you also, mm -hmm. in the third article you had there, you do speculate a little bit of what mm -hmm. that means for our very near future. Yeah. Um, so if I I would very much appreciate if you could tell us more about that, about, you know, people of my generation or our kids, uh, the ones that are yet the youngest now will be facing if this trend doesn't change. Well, so first of all, um, this has never happened before in the history of humanity. Okay. So anything that can happen in this world of collapsing populations is a speculation. And, you know, some historian may look at this video in 2019 and say, you know, this Jesus guy, he was completely wrong. Mm -hmm. But my best guess estimate is that we are going to have, first of all, a terrible problem with welfare states. Okay, so welfare states are basically uh, built on the assumption that younger people are paying for the health care and the retirement pensions of older people. How are you going to do it? I just saw you, China, Korea, but I could have show you Germany, France, Italy, uh, the United States. Now, when I reached at this moment, I always have someone in the audience that raises his hand and say, well, we just bring immigrants. And the, the argument I give is, well, first of all, um, South Korea will need to bring 
basically 75% of the South Korean population will need to be immigrants. Okay, we are not talking here about I bring a few immigrants. I'm talking about levels of immigration that we have never seen in the planet ever before. Okay, where basically South Koreans will be a small minority in their own yeah, country. You're changing the nation. Yeah. Basically, it's, it's, a, it's a completely different nation. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so we are not talking here about, you know, I'm an immigrant in the US. I'm not talking about you bring a couple of Jesuses. No, you, you bring in millions and millions of me. And Marianas. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Um, but second, and that's the point I try to highlight, is <laughs> this fertility episode is happening, decline is happening all across the planet. So the planet as a whole, you know, so far we are not bringing immigrants from any other planet. I don't think this is going to happen anytime soon. So the planet as a whole is not going to have enough immigrants to fix this problem. So the US, yeah, the US is a rich and prosperous economy. You can always bring a few immigrants to kind of fix these things. But imagine if I were Brazilian, okay? Imagine that in, a, in another world, I'm the Brazilian Minister of Finance. Brazil, I didn't show you the graphs, but also collapse in fertility. In fact, the fertility in Brazil now is lower than in the US. Who is going to migrate to Brazil in 2050 to pay for Brazilian social security? I can see, remember, I can see going to China and convincing some Chinese to move to the US to pay for the pensions in the US. I don't know if I want that or not. I'm just saying this is feasible. Mm -hmm. How in the world I'm going to go to any country and convince anyone to move to Brazil? Countries that, again, people don't get the point are about to go down a cliff of population collapse include most Asia and most Latin America. Second. So this is the problem of welfare state. Okay. Yeah, so welfare state, there is just no way you're going to be able to keep that going on, okay? okay. Now, you at this moment is where everyone thinks, oh, yet again, an economist telling me there is no money to pay for what I want. Well, I am sorry, but yes, uh, a, a good friend of mine told me that the main reason why economists are never like is because they are like that annoying kid that in second grade told you that Santa Claus doesn't exist, that things need to be paid. Someone needs to pay for, for the bill. At the end of dinner, someone needs to pick up the bill. Uh, second thing, well, the problem is that what we are seeing in countries like South Korea or even in China is not that the fall of population or in Japan is uniform, okay? So it's not that we are going to be 10% less everywhere in the country. What you are going to have, you are going to have is that nearly all population losses are going to be concentrated in rural and small, area, and small city areas. Because in particular at this moment, uh, younger people really like cities. And the other day I was talking with the daughter of, a, well, my wife was talking with the daughter of one of her friends and she was saying, no, I only want to live in Boston and New York. Well, that's not very unrepresentative of the modern yeah. world. And that means that in South Korea, uh, you are going to have that Seoul, the big metropolitan area, is still going to have a lot of population. What is going to happen is that you are going to go to the rural areas of South Korea and they are going to be empty. And the problem of having an empty area is how do you have schools? How do you have a hospital? How do you have a supermarket? So this is already happening in a lot of rural areas in the Western world, in Japan. Once you cross some threshold of population, the local supermarket closes. Yeah. It's just there's not enough people to show up in the morning to buy milk and bread and meat. But then even if you want to stick around, you cannot stick around because there's no supermarket. Yeah, there is going to be always someone who doesn't mind to drive 100 miles to get food. But once the closest supermarket is 25 miles or farther away from where you live, most people just move on. Okay. And that means that you are going to have huge areas of advanced economies in the rural place that is going to get really empty. And those are going to be very angry and very mad voters because life is not really being very nice with them. And, you know, it's not very good to have a society where 20, 25% of the population is very unhappy. That's, mm -hmm. that, that never leads to good outcomes. And the third point that I, I, <clears throat> I really make uh, over there is that this is, for instance, going to have um, tremendous effects on things like real estate prices. Just yesterday, I think there was an article in a newspaper 
mentioning that at this moment in Japan, there are 10 million empty houses. Well, people die and there is yeah. no one left to go there. What do you do with that house? Okay. And again, this is going to be terrible because if you happen to have houses in areas that are getting depopulated, no one will want to buy them. The price will go down. And again, you are going to have a lot of redistribution of wealth. Yeah. And all these are going to be ripple effects through society and that we haven't really ever experienced before in the history of humanity and how well societies are going to be able to adapt to these challenges is an open question. I'm speechless whenever I, you you know, reading you, listening to you, when you made me think of these things, you know, for me it's reality, you know, the kind, probably it's also for you, the villages, you know, where we come from, where we're born, like you see, you know, I know a lot of a big, beautiful houses that are completely empty and they're just a cost and nobody even wants to buy them, nobody wants to sell them to make nothing out of it. And I, I have very little, you know, I tr usually try to see the look at the positive. So now I should have the question that makes us all laugh and say, no, no, okay, we're going to be, we're going to be fine. Of course, you know, we are all going to be fine, but these are things that, you know, ideas have consequences, some bad ideas that we might have had at some point led to some mm -hmm. very bad consequences. I cannot but link what is happening and what happens to the welfare state to my fears about the assisted suicide and medical, you know, assisted dying that is, you know, taking a lot of, um, is being very successful in some countries because when you're left alone and when there is no grocery near you and when there is no hospital, it's not even that other people ask you, it's just that you feel like it's probably better for you not to yeah. exist anymore, right? If you don't have money and you're in an age where you cannot provide for yourself anymore, um, so we're really leaving people alone uh, in the worst possible way. Um, the question for you, though, is like, is there a way to reverse the trend? <laughs> so I always joke that the question that you should ask is not, is there a way, but is there a way that gets 232 votes in Congress, which is a very different issue. <laughs> okay, well... Since we are not politicians, uh, let's forget about that second thing. Uh, mm -hmm. I think that, yes, there is a way. I think that, as I was mentioning before, um, we can sit down in advanced economies. Look, if you are Africa, it's still okay that your fertility goes down. Uh, fertility in Africa right now is probably too high anyway. So that's that's not the problem. But if you are South Korea, if you are the US, if you are Italy, you are Spain, we need to sit down. And sit down seriously. This is not some silly discussion about, you know, those things that we spend so much time talking about these days. And say, look, how are we going to fundamentally reorganize our societies in ways that make attractive for the average young person to get married and have kids? Okay. Um, I think there is overwhelming evidence that this is not only good for fertility, it's also good for all sorts of other social outcomes. And that the big drop in fertility has made this particularly salient. Mm -hmm. I was mentioning before, there are things that are a little bit easier, things that are a little bit harder. Let me tell you things that are a little bit easier. For instance, we need to change our tax system in a way that favors families. I, my wife and I, I don't know if we joke or we cry, that remains to be seen, but both of us are economists. We are deeply aware that if we divorce, but continue living together, uh, we will pay less in taxes. Well, that's not a society I want to live on. I don't want to live in a society where the day I decide to marry my wife, my tax burden goes up. Uh, it should be the other way around. We should have tax systems that favor families and favor kids. We should have uh, um, educational systems that make having kids easier. Mm -hmm. uh, all the way from kindergarten to college. And that probably means that schools should worry less about all the type of Silly things I think most schools are worried about these days and more about how do we make this a good experience for the family. Yeah. Uh, we should start 
talking and discussing very openly about tax subsidies to families with friends, with with kids. Look, there is <clears throat> economists use a word called externality, which means that when I do something, it affects you. And in general, we don't believe that markets deal very well with externalities. Well, having one kid has an impact on society and that's an externality. So we should reward that externality by giving help to families that want to have more kids. There are issues that are a little bit harder because they are a little bit harder to legislate about, you know, how do you organize societies? As I was mentioning before, the safety seats in schools, mm -hmm. uh, sorry, in cars. Um, you know, ca how can we make New York a place where a kid can again be on the street? Those are harder, but um, I think that uh, you can still make some progress. And finally, and more in general, you know, I guess that <laughs> anyone who looks at my web page is a little bit aware of my own biases, if I may say that. Yeah. I think that um, creating a culture that, that that puts family at the very center of society again is absolutely fundamental. Wow. I mean, for being, you know, being the family at the center of our mission, of our studies, I I mean, I'd appreciate this this closing line um, in terms of putting family at the center, putting family at the center, you know, as a woman and at this point closer to 40 than to 30. Yeah. I, I wonder how many of the women listening have been told, seriously told about their fertility. Yeah. How many women have been told seriously about not the problems of maternity, but the joys of maternity? How often were these conversations had in their classrooms, in their families, in the communities? There is a way, you know, it's not just politics that puts family first. Mm -hmm. There's also, and Professor Agneros writes this in his book, it's also the kind of stories we tell, right? Yeah, exactly. so there are too many stories about the family being the center for violence and where, you know, abuses would happen instead of like... And Yeah, and I'm also a little bit concerned about the message we are transmitting to the new generations. <clears throat> How do I put it? That So I watched the average movie and in the average movie or the average TV show, there is this idea that, oh, you can achieve everything. You know, you can be a great scientist and at the same time, you can be a great father or a great mother and you can be a great sportsman or, uh, and, you know, I get the point of what they're trying to, to do to try to, you know, encourage young kids. But I also think at the very end, they are very, very pernicious messages. Misleading, because, right? Misleading. Because look, guess what? Most people are not going to be this amazing superwoman or superman who's able to succeed in every aspect of life. And maybe it makes much more sense to understand that happiness may not be in where Hollywood tells you that happiness is. And, and I'm very I'm very worried about it. I'm very worried because I see it at my own university, the type of messages we tell to the undergrads. And, and I don't think they are the good messages for life. I don't think that a lot of the undergrads that sit in my classes are going to be very happy people when they are 50. Yeah, there is something about, you say, the encouragement to do a little bit of everything. And instead, we have the counter encouragement was given by Professor Truman when he was on our show, when he said, you know, that one of the best things that he could give us advice is make some choices, close yeah. some doors. And then, so that, you know, you have less options for the next yeah. year and then less. And then you can become very, very good at the two yeah. or three things that you're going to stick with um, as you grow up. And you know, he's also a professor in teaching undergraduates. And of course, you as professors also worry about not only their grades, but also their happiness, which is, you know, a great thing for, for an educator and a mentor. Um, I think that this is a great point to start. And you've also already, you know, with your CV, I feel very, you know, I'm very aware of like how precious uh, in economic terms your, your mm -hmm. time is and you're yep. doing this for free. Um, so, you know, we, we are very grateful uh, for your generosity as we are, of course, of all the people that donate to the Institute and allow us to do um, these kind of things still. Um, you did write recently on artificial intelligence. Um, <laughs> and, you know, the question there is like whether that's going to substitute us. So we're, you know, we're declining as population, then we have just big computer. But um, I don't know if you if you are willing to talk about it maybe on another occasion uh i'm, I'm, I'm sure that... i let me, let me then just 
give a teaser, like, you know, in a, since we were talking about Hollywood, you always have these teasers at the end of the movies. Uh, I just started writing uh, a, a series for the general public on the economics of artificial intelligence. And I think it's likely that public discourse will run it. Well, if they like it, they may not like it. But, you know, if public discourse likes it, um, they will probably run it. So maybe when those articles appear in, on public discourse, we can we can chat about artificial intelligence. It will be our honor and privilege and joy to have you again. Um, Jesus, thank you. Thank you again course, very much. Thank you for having me. Thank you. And to all our listeners, as usual, we hope that you have enjoyed this episode with this economist once more on the family. And remember to share it among your friends if you liked it. Remember to subscribe. And of course, if you can, donate to the Austin Institute. Thank you. Yeah, perfect. Are we recording anymore? Well, I can't stop it now.
Thank you very much for listening, and we hope you enjoyed the episode of our show, What We Can't Not Talk About. If you did like the episode, remember to share it among your friends. Do not forget to subscribe, and if you can, please donate to the Austin Institute. Your donations make it possible for us to continue to do this, but above all, they support our local programming and the important, if not crucial, research of our fellows. Thank you.